Don't touch that phone. You're listening to the Mutual Audio Network, and there's no escape. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Sonic Society Season 10 Finale. Voices in the Wind, Good Things Come. Hi, I'm Jordan Harbour from the Twilight Histories podcast. I've been diving into the Sonic Society for years, and I'm blown away by the diversity, the depth, and often the hilarity of these fantastic audio dramas. Jack Ward has been an inspiration for me in my own journey in podcasting, and I'm so honored today to be introducing this show. And now, the twilight of the Sonic Society's 10th season. The evil Vidic Empire, led by the villainous Vidrix's plan to destroy the entire audioverse and draw all its contents into video streams, forever destroying the audio medium. The diabolical clone of David Alt, David Alternate, if you will, has fired the YouTube weapon at the weakened web, breaking down the RSS feeds. But just as the final blast is released, something appears in the audio space as a shield against the darkness. What is that? Where did it come from? It's sorted. It's blocking the blast! Even she can't stand up to that kind of energy. Yes! Victory! 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 Even now, see how the tortoise is absorbed in energy! Soon, it too will become a part of the video universe! Torn, sonically, asunder, utterly, what? No! No! Voices in the Wind Audio Theater presents Good Things Come, written by Dave Carley and directed by George Zarr. It's a tough break to be a kid and have fun on war rations. But when my mom saves enough 1941 coupons, she buys me Snyder's Chocolate Hand Grenades. They explode in chocolatey goodness inside my tummy, just like the real grenades my daddy throws into the battlefield. Snyder's Chocolate Hand Grenades. Yum. Betty Gow put the baby to bed exactly at nine. The hall clock was chiming as she pinned the blankets tightly around the child, so he couldn't thrash while he slept. Betty turned out the lights and left the room. She went to the kitchen where she had a relaxing Ovaltine. It's not easy minding a baby, especially a really famous one. It was a nasty winter's night, March 1st, 1932 to be precise. Nine years ago, the events of that night are etched in my mind forever. Baby's daddy was in the library, right beneath the infant's room. He was writing letters to important people and signing autographed photos for the less important. Baby's mother was having a bath, working out the tensions of being married to someone so famous. Back upstairs in the nursery, the window was open a good foot. Just like my own daddy, Charles Lindbergh believed in the virtues of fresh air. Oh, so cold. You have to snuggle down. But then, bang! A ladder hits the windowsill. Downstairs in his study, Mr. Lindbergh pauses mid-autograph and wonders about the sound. He decides it's a slat falling off an orange crate in the kitchen. Seriously, a slat off an orange crate? He goes back to his work. Anne Morrow Lindbergh hears nothing over her splashing. Scrape! The 
ladder is finding a grip along the sill. Footsteps up. A shadowy figure appears at the window. A very, very handsome German face becomes visible. Bruno Hauptmann. One foot in, then shoulder in, torso in, other leg. He's here. Bruno pads silently over to Charles Lindbergh Jr. and starts freeing him from his blankets, tisk tisking in broken English at the very idea of pinning a child. Bruno picks the sleeping baby up with one felonious arm and slips back over to the window, leaves a ransom note riddled with spelling mistakes. English is not his first language. Bruno and baby slide down the ladder and straight into the horrified psyche of a nation. That was nine years ago. And I have lived in terror ever since. Delicious terror. Daddy thinks an open window is a guarantee of health. It must be wide open to the elements. All winter. None of those storm windows with three little holes and a flip-up piece of wood. Not for Daddy. One window, open wide. Some mornings I wake up. That's if I've slept. I wake up and there's a dusting of snow across my floor. Sometimes there are footprints. Seriously, and not just the footsteps of the pest. That's my mother. These are real footsteps. German intruder footsteps. This world is full of Bruno Hauptmanns. But around the time I turned 13, I began changing from a girl to a woman. That was four years ago. The fear also began to change. An open window isn't so scary anymore. At least not in the kidnapping-kill-me kind of way. It's more tingly scary. Now, I always keep my window open to the elements. Fresh air is intoxicating. Because a special someone might slide the window up. All the way. Slide it up. Slip in silently. Slither in like a cat. Pad around to my bed, where I'm lying, waiting, all tingly. Ellie, dear, are you okay? Yes, Daddy. Who are you talking to? Myself again. You've been in there all evening. I'm studying. Well, I just wanted you to know that the president was on the radio just now. We've declared war on Germany. Thank you, Daddy. Have a good sleep, dear. Bruno Richard Hauptmann, address 1279 East 222nd Street in the Bronx, an illegal German immigrant. When he was arrested, he had marked ransom money on his person. The police investigation was very sloppy, but there was just too much circumstantial evidence, even with so many errors. Bruno, poor dishy Bruno, was put in the electric chair and fried. Bzz, bzz. America's babies were safe again. America's young girls could sleep again. But America's young women, that's another story. We don't really want to sleep, do we? But alas, even the best laid plans of a young woman can be sidetracked by life. Like Mr. Roosevelt declaring a war. Shh! Elika, take my suitcase. I'm in bed. Come in. Oh, don't throw it on the floor. Don't fall on the floor. A little grace, please. Sorry. Sorry. Ellen? Ellen, I I thought I heard a thump. It's okay, Daddy. I just dropped a textbook. Clumsy dumb cup. You have to be more careful. He won't come in, but the pest might. Your mother? She has ears like Dumbo. Come here. Oh, my beautiful Ellen. Mm. Mm. Oh, slow down, Kurt. What are you doing? Stop that. A little on the ear. Mm. Oh, okay, stop. My throat, too, but just a peck. What's the suitcase for, anyway? Your things. Like you told me. It's a bit small, don't you think? What could fit in that? We can buy stuff later. We can buy stuff later. Stuff? And with what money, Kurt? The money I have been saving from my job at Western Union. Western Union? Hmm. You sure you want to give up that job? Fraulein, for you, I would give up my life. Mein Elika, 
I would walk across burning coals with people whipping my bare back with willow branches. I would scrape a bouquet of thorns over my pink Teutonic buttocks. I would... (sighs) Sending telegrams puts you in a position of confidentiality. Telegrams arrive, telegrams go, some are banal, but some are vital to national interest. And the link in the chain is you, Kurt. You. I don't understand. War has been declared. It is terrible War that... with Germany. Your Germany. Ellen, I am an American. You talk German. Only because you like it. I don't like it anymore. But just yesterday... Yesterday, we weren't at war. I think you should go. Baby... I can't elope with the enemy. I have to draw the line. I will not leave. You are talking crazy. I am American. Like apple pie. More like strudel. I will stay here. Ellen, we are supposed to get married tomorrow. There is a justice of the peace waiting for us in Pennsylvania, and Go. You are breaking my heart. Go. If you change your mind... Yeah, Kurt. I'll send you their telegram. Now go. Leave the window open. Life just got a little more complicated. Clearly, patience is required. I must wait a bit longer for my Bruno Hauptmann, or a reasonable facsimile. Perhaps I could try a Dutchman in the interim. No, it wouldn't be the same. Nothing is tinglier than a young German slipping through your window... How long could a silly war last? It's great to be a kid now that the war is over. And with all the 1946 gasoline my family can waste, my mom drives all over the country and she buys me Snyder's chocolate stuff. Chocolate in the shapes of swimming pools, automobiles, Overstuffed furniture? You know, all the stuff my parents don't need, but are buying anyway. Snyder's Chocolate Stuff. Yum. The war was a real bother. It wasn't easy swearing off German men. But I stayed patriotic. Eventually the war ended, and I've had two lovely years making up for lost time. You're a bit late, Daddy. I know. The pest smells a rat, Daddy. She was knocking on my door asking where you were. I tried to tell her you were in the study studying, but she wasn't buying. Has she gone to bed? She's probably waiting downstairs by the front door, with your gun. Your breath stinks. I only drank vodka. I can smell potato. You're making that up. Daddy, did you always drink so much? Yes, but I used to hide it better. You know I'll always cover for you with the pest. Ellen, dear, shouldn't we think of some some other name for your mother? Why? It suits her. She's always trying to catch you drinking, and she absolutely 100% disapproves of me lying here and reading Ellen, and... Ellen, dear, do you think maybe you should get out more? Why? You're 22. Don't you want to meet someone? I've had boyfriends. Quite a number since the war ended. Klaus, Heinrich, Gunther, Lars, Otto, I'm not Herman. sure your relationships are healthy. And yours is? Climbing in and out of your daughter's window to avoid your uh, wife? But your fellows seem to climb it in and out of your window, too. It would be awful nice if at least one of them came through the front door. Someday, Daddy. Now, try tiptoeing to your study. Don't fall over the hall table like last time. I'm I'm glad we had this talk, Alan. I love you, Daddy. I love you too, dear. Try to be nicer to Mummy. Yeah, yeah. Good luck. Hey, Daddy-o. What a peachy keen time to be a kid. It's 1953, and rock and roll is here to stay. And when my mom and I are busy shoplifting at the store, we're always pilfering Snyder's Chocolate Juvenile Delinquents. Deep dark chocolate that's even sweeter when you steal it. 
Snyder's Chocolate Juvenile Delinquents. Yum. I found a magazine in Daddy's study. It was in a drawer in his desk, in a file labeled Boring Stuff. Which, of course, makes it the first place I looked. Poor Daddy is not good at the art of concealment. It's the very first issue of a magazine called Playboy, December 1953. In my opinion, it is a giant step forward. First of all, the publisher is listed as a Hugh Hefner, which is a good German name. There are women in it who look to be of Germanic persuasion, and the magazine's advisor says that it's okay for a woman to pursue a man, by whatever means. Things are not going so well here. I'm 28 now. My window is open, but as you can see, I am still waiting for my Bruno. The pest has some kind of heart disease, which she blames on Daddy sneaking out all the time. She lies in her bed most of the day now, complaining, and I run the house, which gives me precious little time to loll about reading. Or find Germans. I'm thinking of branching out. I'm thinking of going Dutch. That's a little joke. I've studied the Dutch. They are ethnically similar to Germans. Visually the same, but a bit taller on average. Their English is often very good. They are industrious and clean. They were on our side in the war, which would solve the inevitable strain I have with my German lovers when that topic comes up. The Dutch. Hmm, I'm not sure how well wooden clogs will work on the ladder. But... The pest is too ill to hear them clumping about in here, and Daddy is never home anymore. Vodka calling. I'm 28. I should be settling down. And if it can't be a German, then the next best thing. But where does one find a Dutchman? It's not like they wear signs. With Germans, I just need to mention the existence of an open window behind which tingles an American paradise. I can't imagine the Dutch being any less eager. <laughs> Being a kid today is so groovy. And when my mom comes back from her jet-set flight to swinging London dressed in the latest 1963 fashions, she's always bringing me back Snyder's Chocolate Beetles. John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Their long hair is so cute and sweet that I can't wait to bite off their little chocolate heads. Snyder's Chocolate Beetles. Yum. Ugh, the Dutch thing was a flop. I simply couldn't find one. I'd see a large blonde man on the street, hand him my card. He'd climb up here and turn out to be from Minneapolis. So I branched out. Poles, Swedes, anything with a bit of an accent. Oh, now that Mr. Kennedy is in the White House, I'm even thinking I'll go Irish. There are lots of them around, and I've heard they're very quick on ladders. Where the hell is he? He's really late. It's about time. Sorry. I've had to wait up forever. What won't happen again? I should think not. Because your days of sneaking about are over. Is she... Yes. When? I took her a cup of tea at eight, and she was gone. So you weren't there when... No. I can start using the front door again. Actually, better yet. You don't have to go out if you want to get sloshed. This is rather sad. I was married to the past for for nearly 40 years. She was my mother for 35. She suffered so. We let her down. A tragic life. It's a mercy she's gone. No kidding. <laughs> okay, well, see ya, dear. Where are you going? Downstairs. For a drink. <laughs> Should we call someone? She's just lying there in her bed. Oh, I'll phone the undertaker. Mr. O'Houlihan. Mr. O'Who? Oh, O'Houlihan. The, the new mortician in town. Oh, who the heck? Irish chap. Red face, blue eyes, blonde hair. 
You don't say. W- will you join me for a drink while I wait? No, I'll stay up here. In fact, I think I'll take to my bed. But, Daddy, you're tired and emotional. Let me make the funeral arrangements. Th- th- thank you, Ellen. Th- that is very kind. I, a trying day to be sure. But we'll get through it. A blonde Irishman. Who'd have thunk it? Yes? Is this the funeral home? Who am I talking to? Seamus O'Houlihan. Excellent. It's Ellen McWhirter speaking. I'd like to report a death. My mother. Will you come over? Thank you. Oh, our front door has... frozen shut. I'm afraid you'll have to climb up a ladder. Will that be a problem? It's going to be a very lavish funeral. Thank you. Half an hour? Slanja. Being a kid today is all about peace and love, man. And when my mom floats back from Woodstock, she always has her 1969 tie-dyed bandana filled with Snyder's psychedelic chocolates. The out-of-sight sweetness gets me so high that... that... (laughs) I forgot what I was going to say. Snyder's Psychedelic Chocolates. Yum. I think. (laughs) You're lucky Daddy's deaf. Daddy? Deaf is a post. Your father lives here? It's his house. You never told me that. It didn't occur to me. Now, go back to the window. Please. Do you want me to take off my skates? Yes, I would. Because I prefer not to. My fingers are cold, and the laces are knotted, and... Then leave them on, for God's sakes, but don't clump. Daddy's deaf, but he can feel vibrations. Uh, uh, uh. I fell, you know. Your ladder's icy. It's dangerous. You didn't have to wear skates. I'm not wearing them for you. Why can't you sleep on the ground floor? That would be real exciting. Yawn. (laughs) Breaking my neck is? Yes. You're kinky. I like that. Okay. I'm going to pretend I'm asleep. I like that too. Take off your coat. Now we're cooking. I like to swing. My wife and I. Someday we should get together with you and your husband. I I mean in the future. For now, this is fine. Just you and me. But back in Connecticut, they have parties where couples just throw their keys in a bowl and have at it. I'm not married. What? No husband. But you said, be careful not to wake my husband. Mm, I think if you read my letter again, you'll see it says old man. As in deaf old daddy who's got one foot in the grave. But my fantasy... Ryan, telegram from Western Union, beep, 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 beep. I don't give a hoot about your fantasy. I wanted to sneak into a woman's bedroom on ice skates. I clearly told you this in my letter, and you seemed fine with it. And the key part of the fantasy is that your husband is somewhere on the premises. Because I like the element of danger Well, that's not my fantasy. And since I'm hosting this party, we'll do mine. I've already made enough concessions. After all, you're... Brian. That's hardly ethnic. Judging by the skates, I suppose you're some kind of Canadian. I only asked that you come up a ladder, slip in here, and carry me off in your arms like I'm seven years old. Whoa, seven? Seven. Seven. Not a chance. No. Seven. That's sick. That's really sick. Seventeen? That's a bit less sick. But in my fantasy, you also have to be a bored housewife. A 17-year-old can't be a bored housewife. I think if we... uh, Yeah, you know what? This really isn't working. Why does everything have to get so complicated? In the summer, I swim across suburban pools until I find a housewife eager to swing. June, July, August, splish splash, jump in, jump out, home by nine. Then in the fall, I rest up for winter. 
Finally, December comes. Things freeze. I skate across the pools until I find a bored housewife eager to swing. That's Connecticut. Tonight, however, I foolishly make an exception. Turn left at Greenwich. Cross one state and end up in New Jersey. And what do I find? A woman with a deaf daddy who wants me to pretend she's seven. No, that's just not something I do. And don't get up. <laughs> Clumsy man. Daddy always says, good things come to those who wait. One day, my Bruno will come. Being a kid today is some sort of awesome and radical. And when my mom crawls home after a night of being the disco queen of 1977, she always tosses me a box of Snyder's Chocolate Lava Lamps. You can get a righteous vibe by just holding them in your hand and letting them melt and move all over the floor. Just like a real lava lamp. Can you dig it? Snyder's Chocolate Lava Lamps. Yeah. I'm just saying the dancing is not the first thing you think of doing the day you bury your father. And who was that old guy downstairs, anyway? Mr. Houlihan, the funeral director. You dance well. You're not bad either for a... For a what? I mean for a... You mean for a 53-year-old woman? Well, yeah. At the disco, they're usually fresh out of high school. You should be grateful. One day, older women will be in vogue, and you'll be glad you had this experience. I can teach you stuff none of those little tramps know. Yeah, like how to snort Metamucil? <laughs> hey, what do you get when you mix Geritol with bourbon? Why'd you do that? I don't like jokes about age. Not my fault, you're 70. 53. I think you should leave. Yeah? Well, I was thinking that too. I can barely keep time to the music with your bones creaking out of rhythm. Out. Out the window. Use the ladder. As if? I'm serious. Out the window. I only let you in the front door because Mr. O'Houlihan was here and he gets jealous. Well, picking up a guy at the disco on the night you bury your father and asking him to go up and down a ladder is weird. I'm out of here. As in, out the door. The stuff is on the table there. What stuff? The stuff you can steal. What? Your kind steals. I'm making it easier for you. So go steal. But do it fast. I ain't stealing. And I ain't going out the window. Whoa! Lady! Is that a loaded gun in your hand? It was my daddy's. Now steal. Window. Easy, lady! Don't aim that at me! Sheesh! I'm surprised you don't have a blunderbuss. Joke, joke, sorry. I'll take them silver cufflinks. You're really serious about the window? These shoes aren't good on ladders. Okay, 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 I'm going, I'm going. It's a tough break to be a kid and have fun with all the wars and violence going on. But when my mom can fight her way through the pollution, she always brings me back Snyder's Chocolate Hand Grenades. They explode in chocolatey goodness inside my tummy, just like the real grenades my daddy throws into the battlefield. And the recession is so bad, they'll both have to work three jobs just to afford them. Snyder's Chocolate Hand Grenades. Yum. When a woman reaches 85, she has to accept the fact that her window isn't going to slide open quite so often. In fact, my only visitors now are pizza boys. And they won't deliver up a ladder. In fact... Most of them won't deliver here at all. They leave the pizza out on the street, yell, and run. An 85-year-old woman understands that if she wants opportunity to knock, she has to be devious. 
and I am. Gosh, I smell smoke. <laughs> Is that 911? Oh, I phoned a few minutes ago and spoke to a nice man about a possible fire in Hopewell. 78 Franklin Street. Miss Ellen McWhorter. Oh, it was you. Well, I can confirm there is indeed a fire, and I think you should send someone around. I'm alone here, confined to my bed. The fire is getting worse. I believe it was a, a kerosene spill in my late father's study, so the house could go up like that. Poof. The house is an old wood colonial, dry as dust, full of old playboys. I've left my window open, second floor, north side. Oh, wait, uh, I think someone is arriving. I'll hang up now and wait for deliverance. Soothing voice, that 911 fellow. I might phone him again sometime. I don't know why I didn't think of this before. A few matches, a bit of kerosene, and you get a house full of handsome firemen. Windows open! <sighs> There's a fire downstairs. You're going to have to carry me out. Just a second, ma'am. I have to pull up my walker. Now, you'll have to speak clearly into my right ear. You're a bit old for a fireman. Eighty-five. That's old. It is very old. Mm. Oh, what happened to the strapping young men I see in calendars? They are professionals. Hopewell is a volunteer fire department, a dog's breakfast of retirees. And tonight, most people are home watching the basketball finals. March Madness. I never liked basketball. Soccer was always my game. So, it is just me. The room below here is engulfed in flames. That's the study. It's full of literature. Can you walk? You'll have to carry me. I would prefer you walk. I'm old. I am older. I'm practically a cripple. I am getting a knee replacement in April. I can't wait till then. I am just saying... If you... Bring your walker over. I'll slide into the seat, and you can push me over to the window. Good thinking. How come I've never seen you around town? I only retired to Hopewell at Christmas. There was a sign at the post office asking for volunteer firefighters, and I thought it might be fun. You're 85? And you just retired? I own the company. Now, are you on? I will push. Wait. Where did I put my axe? I forgot it in the truck again, I bet. Actually, if you do not mind, I will just sit on your bed and catch my breath. We have still got time. I get angina. Smoke brings it on. But if I just sit still for a moment, maybe we can talk about things, get my mind off my chest. Uh, what was your company? 
Western Union. Oh, I remember them. Telegrams. I began working for them when I was a teenager. Back when everything was dot dash dot. The 1940s. The war against the Hun. I couldn't enlist because of an ingrown toenail. And I ended up at the Pentagon doing translations. After the war, I went back to Western Union and began rising through the ranks, right up to CEO. And the whole time, I was collecting stock options. Eventually, I just bought the place. Oh, paint is gone. Now I will stand up. Oh, my knee. I will sit back down again. We have got a problem. Well, I'll say. You still have to carry me down the ladder. <laughs> like that is going to happen. You're a fireman. You've come here on an emergency call to save a desperate old woman. Her home is engulfed in flames. The only option is you pick her up in your arms and carry her down the ladder to safety. I will pop my shoulder right out of the socket. Try. Stand up and try. Okay. Okay. I will stand up. Oh, I will sit down again. Oh, what now? Orthotic hypertension. Low blood pressure. Oh, this can't be happening to me. Okay. <clears throat> Here. You sit on the walker, and I'll push you. Give me a boost. One, two, three. Oh, my oh. God. Be Sorry. gentle, woman. Sorry. <laughs> there. Okay. Here's what we're doing. I'm going to push you out the door. When we get to the stairs, I'll just tip you forward a bit and you slide down. I'll follow you and pull you out the front door by your good leg. What's your name? Kurt. Uh, Ellen McWhorter. Pleased to meet you. This room looks vaguely familiar. Focus, Kurt. When I open the door, hold your breath until you hit the bottom of the stairs. We're going to be fine, Kurt. Are you married? Uh, widower. Mm, looking? I'm on eHarmony and Tingling Seniors. Really? And... MeterGerman.com <laughs> Well, I'll be darned. It's just like my late daddy used to say. Good things come to those who wait. Of course, I didn't expect to wait 63 years. So, Kurt, take a deep breath. Let's get out of this place. We've got some living to do. Good Things Come was written by Dave Carley, directed by George Zarr, and featured Georgia Lee Schultz as Ellen, Keith Burnett as the father, Brady Van Varenberg as Kurt, Bill Craven as Brian, John Frey as Vincent, and Emma McDonald as the Snyder's Chocolate Girl. Recording engineer and post-production, David Farquhar. Voice editing and commercials, George Zarr. This has been a Voices in the Wind audio theater production. Where are we? Looks like on a hill, overlooking a harbor. Wait, wait, we're, we're in Halifax. But, but the Vidic, the, the YouTube weapon, the tortoise. All gone. Look, at your feet. It's the Audi. What's left of it anyway. It's like it was blown into pieces. When the David Alternate was going to destroy audio space, he must have still been linked with the tortoise.
and the old girl made one last leap into that maelstrom. Or David from the past programmed her that way. Smart guy, him. But I'm afraid that's it. No Audi, no Heart of the Tortoise, no Tortoise. No more adventures in audio time and space. Our travels are over. Over? But but the Desert Wind Cutter? Gone. The, the, the island in the center of the tortoise. Destroyed. The sea voyage? All gone, Jack. I'm sorry, it's gone. It was the only way to save the audioverse, and ironically, it probably did more damage to the Videk than anything else. What do you mean? I mean the Sonic Society now has a large presence on YouTube, our own channel, as does Decoder Ring Theatre and many others. The Videk wanted video to destroy audio space, but if anything, audio claimed part of that video territory for its own. So the show... The show will go on. Change as it always does, but go on. Where are you going? With the tortoise destroyed, that means my TARDIS is destroyed as well. Might as well get a plane ticket back to England. Well, there's still Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. There is indeed. Sorry about the TARDIS. Trust me, Jack, it's not just a Time Lord that regenerates. As long as there's need for a doctor, there'll be need for a TARDIS. Speaking of need for a doctor... How is this, Governor? I'd make a right cracking doctor, I would. That's the worst Cockney accent I've ever heard. And I watched Mary Poppins. Oh, that hurt Dick Van Dyke, and he doesn't even know why. Oh, he knows. The Sonic Society was written and produced by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with guests for tonight John Bell from Bells in the Bat Free and Jordan Harbour from the Twilight Histories podcast. Go check out both shows, they're marvellous. Music by Sharon B. And with thanks to everyone who contributed and supported the Sonic Society, both this season and these ten seasons. Be with us next week as we begin our summer season and return as well in September as we begin the all-new Season 11 of the Sonic Society. The Sonic Society is from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada and is an Electric Vicuna production. Thank you and good night. Hello, Sonic Society friends. Thank you so much for a wonderful present of Season 10. Um, I, I, I like to say thank you at the end of every season because I'm so grateful to be a part of this grand community of audio drama. And, and you who year after year or just found us, whatever you are, whatever stage you're in for listening to the Sonic Society and audio drama, just Please keep listening because I love the fact that we can move this world and we can make this change and that podcast seems to be becoming more and more relevant as time goes by and audio drama is becoming more and more relevant as time goes by. So <laughs> thank you everyone who made season 10 so spectacular. All the people who said, Jack, would you play my show? And uh, David, my amazing co-host and the people who have asked me and david throughout the year to to voice some of your your own podcasts and your own shows and who have asked us to be guests and people who have come on as guests and i just so many people to thank and i just want to thank everyone um i also want to have a, a really special thank you for this particular gentleman who is our guest uh, often on the Sonic Society. And you heard, again, the last several Sonic Societies playing the Vitek and Vitrex. Of course, our own uh, John Bell from Bells in the Bat Free. A <laughs> quick little story. So I'm, I'm behind with the Sonic Society at the end of the year, as sometimes I am as a teacher. I get caught up with all the marking that gets thrown at me in the end. And I, I really appreciate you for, for understanding and, and being sensitive to the fact that I have to get caught up. So I, I got all the stuff out for John and for David, and they sent me back all these tracks. And I'm putting them together a little late than I want to. And then I started cleaning up my, my computer and I found this one track called Bonus. And I thought, Bonus? What's this for? And I didn't even know it was audio drama, to be quite honest. It was in my download folder on my studio compu computer. So I, I just started playing it. <laughs> and I don't want to ruin it anymore for you. But it'll tell you why um, John Bell is so dear to our hearts. And to yours too, I hope. Have a great summer. See you in Sonic Summerstock Playhouse, and we'll see you next year in Sonic Society Season 11. Thank you so much. Enjoy. We have 
captured David. Oh, we got him this time. We now have the doctor. He will pay for all his crimes. For the crimes of the David. Oh, the doctor got to go. For the crimes of the David. Oh, the doctor got to go. I say, doctor. You got a nasty face. I say, doctor. We will exterminate. I say, doctor. Can we leave my belly in? I say, doctor. We will exterminate. You say you captured David. Oh, we got him this time. You now have the doctor. He will pay for all his crimes. For the crimes of the David. Oh, the doctor got it go. All the crimes of the David. Oh, the doctor got it go. I say, doctor. You got a nasty face. I say, doctor. We will exterminate. I say, doctor. I say doctor! No, it's Dominic! It's Dominic! It's Dominic! It's Dominic! It's Dominic! This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Hi, I'm Persephone Rose, executive producer for Postal Roach and the creator of Emperor Pigs. I'm a huge fan of audio drama, and if you're listening to this right now, I've got a sneaking suspicion you might be too. So make sure your headphones are plugged in tight because you're going to want to hear this. From July 24th through the 26th in 2020, producers, directors, composers, writers, actors, technicians, and fans of audio drama are gathering together for the world's first international modern audio drama convention in Halifax, Nova Scotia. This is going to be amazing. If you like panels, there's going to be panels. Workshops, they've got them. Studio sessions, swag events, live performances, and most importantly, all your favorite creators are going to be there. You can get all the details and purchase your tickets online at www.madcon.com. That's M-A-D hyphen C-O-N dot com. See you at Madcon.